this is the ocean. We need to take really good care of this. Deep under here, you don't see it, but there's a lot of life here. Food and marine life. We need the oceans more than the oceans need us. On the Canadian west coast, here in Vancouver, British Columbia, you can look over the Pacific. It stretches more than 7,500 kilometers to Japan. This is the largest body of water on the planet, and it used to be teeming with fish and marine life. Now, that is changing. The world's oceans, covering 70% of the surface of the planet, were once seen as an infinite supply source for humans to use. But the oceans are under strong pressure. Scientific data from Rashid Sumaila and other researchers show that the global fish catch has stalled and is now falling, despite increased efforts from fishing fleets all over the world. There is less and less fish to catch. The research of this year's laureate shows us how imminent and devastating the threats are to fish and marine life. But he also has solutions. If we make the high seas the fish bank of the world, we'll get these benefits ecologically, economically, and also socially. Beautiful idea. For years, researchers here have been compiling data and statistics on global fish catch. What they have found is that official statistics don't add up. There is more fish caught than officially reported. So our group led by Daniel Pauli have been spending time trying to re-estimate and get us as close to the true catch as possible. Globally, we are seeing that actually the official data is about 50% off. The first reaction is, but it doesn't correspond to the official catch. But the official catch doesn't correspond to reality. The global fish catch in the world from 1950 to 2010 was 3.6 billion metric tons, reported officially. But when the researchers at the Institute for the Oceans and Fisheries took into account all fishing, recreational, illegal, local non-reported fishing and more, they came up with a much higher figure, 5.4 billion metric tons. That is 50% higher than the official figures. Stevston was once a bustling fishing village. Nowadays, the fishing boats spend most time in port, since their fishing quotas are quickly filled. It's very slow here compared to what it used to be historically. Randy Pilford has been a fisherman all his life, but now his fishing vessel Calvada is mostly moored at the Cayside. It was a really good lifestyle when I was younger. You think there's still a lot of fish out there? I'm not sure about that anymore. It's got worse every year. What would you say to a young man? Would you say go into the fishing industry? No. No? No. Marine life has taken a devastating hit in the last 40 years. A recent study from the Worldwide Fund for Nature indicates a nearly 50% decline in marine life populations between 1970 and 2012. But overfishing and overexploitation of marine resources aren't the only threats to the oceans. There are several million tons of plastics entering the oceans every year. If we don't do something to stop this, in the next few decades there might be more plastic in the ocean than fish, which is quite scary, I mean. And this plastic, they, they break into little pieces, microplastic. The fish see them and they think it's algae. They eat them, it pollutes them, and also actually can pollute people. Related to pollution is climate change, which is responsible for change in the oceans more rapidly than at any other point in recorded history. We can see that there's a general decline in both of the catch and the revenue in the, along the tropical region. When the temperature is getting warmer, this habitat is not suitable for them anymore. A slight rise in temperature will change ocean currents and also disrupt the ocean's food chain. 
every animal, like mm -hmm. people, we have a comfortable range of temperature. Mm -hmm. uh, when it's too hot, me and you, we can put on the air condition. Or if it is too cold, we put on the heater. The fish don't have that. They either have to move and follow the temperature, or if they can, they perish. One of Rashid Sumaila's suggestions has been to ban fishing altogether on the so-called high seas. These are the unregulated areas covering two-thirds of the oceans. The high seas are owned by everyone and no one, which means they're up for grabs and undefended. We make the high seas a fish bank of the world where the fish can hide and grow. That will give us, make the biodiversity improve. That will make the economics improve because instead of going into the high seas and burning carbon and spending a lot of money to catch the fish, the fish come in within the EEZ, so it's cheaper to catch. The idea to ban fishing in the high seas was originally seen as totally unrealistic. People thought I was crazy, really. But, but now people are saying, hey, maybe this is a wise thing. For the same reason that you don't open your savings account to all kinds of expenditures. And the more you think about it, the more you like it. There is now a growing support for protection of the high seas. And the first high seas marine protected area, the Ross Sea in Antarctica, has recently come into force. New technology, which makes it possible to track down fish virtually everywhere, can also be a main tool for monitoring and help in creating sustainable fisheries. This is amazing stuff. Every fishing boat that has a tracker in the world, you can actually look for individual vessels here. This is going to be the future of surveillance, at least in the high seas. This exists now. Just a few ways, okay? Another of Rashid Sumaila's research areas is subsidies to fishing fleets. Many governments around the world give subsidies to the fishery sector with good intentions, but a lot of these subsidies actually lead to overfishing. So one of the things you want to do, don't give subsidies that leads to overcapacity and overfishing. In many parts of the world, uh, there's a lot of illegal fishing going on. You need to have a system that changes the economic equation such that it doesn't pay to fish illegal. For more than 20 years now, Rashid Samaila has worked relentlessly with research on the future of the oceans. Perhaps an unexpected career for a boy growing up in a Taylor family in the Nigerian countryside. Everything started with my daddy, who was quite progressive. He said, you know what? Go do whatever you really have passion for and do it very well. Even if it is cleaning gutter. Once you, you do it well, they will look for you. So that, that thing was really powerful to me. It kind of liberated me. So for graduate school, I decided I would do economics because I was free to do anything. His studies took him to Norway, where the fishing industry has always been important in the economy, and led to a doctorate in fisheries economics. So that is how I got into fisheries, and since then I've done fisheries all through. The oceans are amazing, that is where most of life is, balancing the climate and, and giving us lots of food. But at the same time, it is facing a lot of threats to something that is so valuable to people, and that it's really keeping me busy, keeping me passionate. How can we get solutions to keep this amazing natural system that we have going sustainably, not only for us, but also for future generations? Rashid is one of the stars. He can actually pass very complicated issues in very simple terms to the public. And that completely captivates me. You should see him giving lectures. He is an incredible orator. You can see that the passion drives him. He's camera friendly and he collaborate really effectively with people. People want to work with him. It changed my life, you know, to have such a positive person in your corner all the time. We are incredibly proud of him as one of our most eminent scientists. We can do it, we can sustain the ocean. The threats to the oceans eventually comes down to our relation to them. The oceans are our lives. This is where life on the planet began. Most people love to be close to water and to the oceans. And we now need to understand how intertwined we as humans are to all marine life.